Amen. That was good. Thanks for praising the Lord together. I like that. On that second song, Diane hits that high note. I like that. It's kind of cool. I, I just like it all. So praise the Lord. Well, welcome to HBF. It's good to, good to be here with you all. Good to have family together. And I do pray that you're looking forward to having your family together for Thanksgiving. And if you don't have family, well, hey, you got some in Christ. We're glad you're with us and we'll be your family. I, I think this, we're going to have to do, if I was giving out awards by section, I'd say you get number one. This section's getting pretty cramped over here. And this section's, it's, it's doing pretty good. Guys, we've got to get to work, man. We've got to invite some people, get this section filled up. So, no, I'm just kidding you, uh, kind of. All right, so, um, anyway, are you guys encouraged this morning? I hope so. Had a good time in your ABF, loving God, loving people. And uh, we're going to get in the Word of God this morning in the book of 1 John, chapter 5. And uh, we're on the homebound stretch. And after this series, I'm going to do a series through December on Christmas. Uh, dealing with peace on earth, of course, uh, appropriate for the Lord Jesus' return. So make sure we invite our friends and neighbors as we take each week through December and walk through the Christmas story and different aspects and, and uh, talk about the Lord Jesus Christ, because this is a time where people need peace in their heart. Um, and so uh, this morning, if you have your Bibles, in First John chapter 5 is where we're going to start. If you don't have a Bible, grab one uh, from the seat rack, and you can turn to page 1,634 in the back of that Bible, and uh, we are glad that you are here uh, with us today, and you can be turning there. If you ha are not familiar with the Bible, start in Revelation and then go forward uh, to that. Uh, so as we come to this final chapter in our study of 1 John chapter 5, uh, we've seen some things already a few weeks ago. You've slept since then, so I'll, I'll kind of remind you where we've been. Uh, in this final chapter, God through John gives us the knowledge that we need to have uh, evidence, uh, witness, and confidence of eternal life. This morning we'll be talking about the witness. So John doesn't give us insurance. He gives us and grants us the assurance of the evidence of the birth. In the, in the first five verses, we already saw that a couple weeks ago. And then today we're going to look at the witness of eternal life in verses 6 through 12. And then uh, next time we get together, we're going to see the confidence in his son, Jesus Christ, in verses 13 to 21. So that gets us through the chapter. And then, uh, it's, since it's been a little while, I'll remind you where we were last time we met in those first five verses. Uh, in the first five verses, we saw that knowing that we need to know the evidence of the new birth, and it's important, first of all, to assure our hearts that we are the sons of God. So knowing the evidence of the new birth assures our hearts that we are the sons of God. Secondly, we saw that it gives us the ability to discern the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. And uh, thirdly, uh, uh, we saw that, um, um, I think that's all we saw now I think about it. So anyway, <laughs> I'm looking at my notes here. That's all we saw. So uh, in the first, in first John chapter uh, four, we saw that. And then thirdly, we saw that there's victory over the world. I, there I go in verses uh, five through four. So I lost my way there for a minute. So those three things are what we know. They give evidence of the new birth, a love for the children of God, a love for the God's word and the victory over the world. And that leads us to where we are this morning. So today we're going to see the witness of eternal life. And God is going to produce the infutable and empirical evidence uh, in the courtroom of heaven and the courtroom of earth. And by God's grace, the courtroom of our hearts. So if you have your Bibles, 1 John chapter 5, I just want to run through the text. And I'm going to pick it up in verse um, 4. And then we'll come on down through verse 12 together. If you would, let's stand in honor of God's word, honor God's word as we read it. 1 John chapter 5, verse 4, it says, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood, and it is the Spirit that beareth witness because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And there are three that bear record, uh, or I'm sorry, that bear witness in the earth, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree in one. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater, for this is the witness of God, <clears throat> which he hath testified of his Son. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself, he that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave, his, gave of his Son. 
And this is the record that God hath given us eternal life, and that this is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for your word this morning. We have uh, stood before your throne, and we have read your words. Your words are true. Uh, Your spirit is true. It just said so in the text. And Lord, may we be true to your word. May the truth of your word dwell in us richly this morning. And may we learn and glean this morning from the, the witness of eternal life, the Lord Jesus Christ, his spirit and the Father in heaven, the blood and the water. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So, uh, you may have been under a rock this week, but there was a really famous uh, trial that went on. And, uh, and so I thought, man, the timing is impeccable uh, to come to this passage because we're dealing with this record and the witnesses. And so from, this, uh, from, the, from uh, time to time, there are trials like the one that went on this week with Kyle Rittenhouse or that finished up this week, took several weeks, it ca- that capture the attention of the news media and the culture. <clears throat> you know, many of us can remember the OJ trial or, uh, you know, the Rodney King trial and this trial and that trial. There's always these trials that come along and they capture people's attention, and the news gets a hold of it, and they have an impact in culture. So when you, when you get to the bottom of a, of a matter in regard to a trial, in our justice system anyway, uh, a trial is held to determine the veracity of the charges or the charge, and uh, that is done so the judge uh, or, in the, or the jury can render a just verdict, uh, depending on how that trial goes. This morning, we're going to see that God's God, uh, see, we're going to see God call witnesses to prove the veracity of the claim of eternal life that comes through Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now, for most of us here, you're, you're probably here on a Sunday morning in November because you're in the Amen Choir. You're not, you're not going to need a lot of convincing. Uh, but by God's grace, uh, we will learn some things, and maybe you're here this morning and you really have never fully grasped the reality uh, or the evidence that Jesus Christ truly is who God said he was and who he said he was, which is God manifest in the flesh. And so this morning, we're going to see, we're going to see John do three things. First, he's going to call witnesses. Then he's going to instruct the jurors. And lastly, he will render a judgment, which goes on in any good trial. So stick with me because the verdict of this trial will be given each and every, in each and every heart. It's not in the courtroom of heaven. Uh, or on the earth. It's actually the, the, the verdict that I want to find from this sermon um, is in our hearts. Each and every one of us need to have a heart that is convicted and convinced of who Jesus Christ is, and therefore our life goes forth in, in glory and honor to him. So if we're going to have the assurance of eternal life, it's important that we call uh, the witness of eternal life. So if you have an outline in front of you, the first thing that we're going to see this morning is is the call called the witness of eternal life. And it, that's very clear. In John chapter 8, in verse 17, the Bible says, It is also written in your law, Jesus speaking uh, to the Jews there, that the, that the testimony of two men is true. I am one that bear witness of myself, and the Father that sent me beareth witness of me. And so he says, hey, uh, in the law, there's two witnesses. And when you have two witnesses... Uh, that, is, that is substantiated uh, a, a fact, in essence. You can submit that in, in a court hearing, so to speak. In Deuteronomy 17, uh, in verse 6, Jesus is actually citing this among other passages, which I'm not going to get into all of them. But he says, At the mouth of two witnesses, or three witnesses, shall he that is worthy of death be put to death. But at the mouth of one witness, he shall not be put to death. And so Jesus is re- hearkening back to this, in this case, a capital case, a capital murder case. And if there are two witnesses that have seen a capital murder or three witnesses, he's like, you should take their word as evidence. <clears throat> you should put that in the record and say, this is evidence that that person actually did. But if you only have one person accusing another person, then you need to throw that out because it's just not enough. You need, you need two witnesses. And so what he does, I believe John is doing here, is he's dealing with witnesses and records in the text that we just read, is he's lining up his witnesses and he's making sure the record is set straight. Now, Jesus, as he came to the Pharisees and the leadership of Israel, he says, hey, you've got two witnesses. You've got me and my father, right? And if you need a third, of course, there's the Holy Ghost. And so those three are one. 
And of course, their weight is heavy because they are true. But point A here, the first witness is the Godhead. So he calls the first witness, and the first witness is the Godhead. Now notice in verse 7, it says, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Now this is a really important passage because the term we use today to say Godhead is typically the word Trinity. I mean, you've heard the word Trinity. I think everybody's heard the word Trinity. We don't often run around saying the Godhead, but that's what, when I say Godhead, that's what I'm talking about. Father, Son, Holy Ghost, these three are uh, all equal and one and uh, separate personages of the Godhead, which is kind of makes our minds scramble, but that's what the Bible teaches. That's what Jesus lays forth in the book of John and throughout the whole of the Bible. So the Godhead will be represented uh, in your Bible. You're going to find this out, and that's why you, I opened up with John chapter 8. Jesus Christ represents the Godhead. We've already seen in this, in this epistle, right, when we were back in chapter 2, that Jesus Christ is our advocate and our propitiation, right? He acts as our attorney, and he also acts as our surrogate, right? He's our, he ends up going to, to, to take our punishment for us. So we've covered all of that. So he is our advocate. He's our propitiation. He also speaks on behalf of the Father, and he tells the Jews that um, himself, that, hey, I, I'm speaking on behalf. Because why? Well, you've never seen God. And so in John 1.18, uh, he says, no man has seen God. And then in John chapter um, 6 and verse 46, he says, no man's seen the Father. But then he turns around and says, if you've seen me, Philip, you've seen the Father, right? Because I and the Father are one. So he is the visible manifestation of the Father. He represents the Father. And so um, w- when he's talking to, to those and advocating on earth, because he is the propitiation not only for our sin, but he's also an advocate uh, uh, between uh, the nation of Israel, in the case of the, the Gospels, and God the Father. So you can't see the Holy Ghost either, but you can feel him, right? John chapter 3 is very clear. When Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, he's like, you can't discern what's going on, but, but the Holy Spirit is like, well, he's like the wind, right? You can feel the wind, but you can't see the wind. He's an invisible person, and he's present, but you can't always, well, you can't, always, you can't see him, but you can see the evidence, right? That's why we had the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5. So you can't see him, but there's, there's manifest fruit. There's an evidence you can even sense in your heart and feel things that the Spirit of God uh, brings upon our hearts. So, but you also got to try the Spirit to make sure they're of God. Just a little warning there, so don't get too caught up in your emotion. And that leaves us with Jesus, <clears throat> the, the manifestation of God in the flesh to represent the Godhead or the Trinity. Now, in John chapter 14 and verse 9, uh, the Bible says, J- Jesus saith unto him, I have been so long time with you, and yet thou hast not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father, and how sayest thou then, show us the Father? He says, hey, if you've seen me, Philip, you have seen the Father. All the Father you're going to see is going to be manifest in Christ. Like he is the manifestation of the Father. And, uh, and so this, uh, this witness came by water And blood, it says in verse 6. Now, I want to back up. Let's look at the text a little closer. Now, we're dealing with overcoming the world, and he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. You know, that's the person that's overcome the world. And then he goes on to verse 6 and says, This is he that came by water and blood, particularly, John is pointing out, Jesus Christ. Not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. So, if you look at this sentence and you break it down, You're going to see water, you're going to see blood, and you're going to see the Spirit. And so this witness came by water and blood. What's this all about? The water and the blood. Not by water only, but water and blood. Let me give you the standard teaching that ties also in with verse 8, dealing with the Spirit, the water, and the blood, because those three show up together. The standard teaching is that you, you are saved by water baptism, which is totally false, and, and uh, people who believe that, i uh, like to, to give this rendition that I'm about to share with you, uh, and that is that the, the water here is dealing with John the Baptist, and they, they predispose to that because they want people to be saved by works. There's really only two religions, not even religions, there's only two ways, right? One is an error and one is true. The true way is through Jesus Christ and his finished work. It's called grace. You can only be saved by grace through faith in what Jesus Christ has done on the cross. The f- all false religions, I don't care what title you put on it, it can be called Christian, it can be called Islam, it can be called whatever, it can be called Buddhism. Whatever you want to call it is going to say you need to do something. 
Uh, you, need to, you need to do something to earn your way uh, into God's favor. Now, we do something not because we're earning our way into God's favor. We do something because we've come to the place that we recognize the fact there's nothing we could do when we trusted Jesus Christ's finished work on the cross. His blood was shed for us, no doubt about it. And so we trust him. <clears throat> but those who like to teach what's called, there's a fancy word that you have to pay about 50 bucks for it. I think it's, and it's called baptism regeneration, <clears throat> which just means you need to be baptized by water. Excuse me, uh, to be saved, right? And uh, some that teach that say you got to be sprinkled and then you're brought into the church and it's really being members of the church that saves you. That's not accurate either. Jesus Christ saves us and that's what makes us members of his body, which com composes the church. And or others say you have to be dunked in water. And that is, and uh, if you get dunked in water, then it's the water baptism that saves you, which we know that's not true because believer's baptism, which we celebrated last week, is a picture, right? of the one true baptism. And the one true baptism is when we trust Christ as Savior and the Spirit of God indwells us and we're quickened by His Spirit. So that's the one true baptism. Believer's baptism, which we do observe in water, is simply a picture of what happens when someone trusts Christ for salvation by grace through faith. And I think that should be, all of you, hopefully many of you get, or most of you get that and understand that. That's very important. It's very basic, but it's also confused and confounded by many people today and it has been since the Garden of Eden because uh, the devil always wants to get people to try to work instead of trust the sacrifice that God has provided, which is the Lamb of God. All right, so, so most teach that you can be saved by water baptism. And so then, this refers to the baptism of John, and they kind of tie that together. The reason they believe this is that when Jesus was baptized, the Holy Ghost did descend upon him, and the Father affirmed Jesus' public ministry. He did. In Matthew chapter 3, of verse 16, uh, and I'm not taking anything away from Jesus' public ministry to the nation of Israel. Uh, he says, And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, heavens were open, and then to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. And lo, a voice from heaven, <clears throat> a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. <clears throat> so Jesus' baptism was a monumental uh, event, and it did signify his public ministry to the nation of Israel. Um, and that was incredible. However, uh, most people teach that the, the blood here also is referring, uh, that is referred to here, is Jesus' shed blood on the cross. And Jesus did uh, come to die for our sins, and he, and he did the work of atoning for our sins when he died on the cross. So this, too, uh, cannot be emphasized enough, uh, for sure. The sacrifice of Christ and his shed blood is the, of the utmost significance to our salvation. When Jesus died, he, he you know, the skies were darkened, the earth shook, and the veil of the temple was rent. And so I would never argue that that is not incredible. That's, for us, that's, that's everything. We need to know that. So you find in Luke chapter 23, verse 44, the Bible says, and it was about the sixth hour that there was a darkness over the, uh, all the earth until the ninth hour, and the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was rent in the, in the midst. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, uh, he said, Father, into, my, into thy hands I commend my spirit, and having said thus, he gave up the ghost. Now when the centurion saw <clears throat> what was done, he glorified God, saying, Certainly this was a righteous man. Of course, he was more than righteous, uh, the, a righteous man. He is the righteousness of God. But uh, he can go to Romans chapter 10 later and find that out. But the Spirit did bear witness to the veracity of Jesus' birth, his ministry, his death, his burial, his resurrection. And so all of that is certainly true, and I'm not, I would never argue against that, so I want to be clear about that. That's incredible, those things that we just read. Nonetheless, I'd submit to you that John is pointing out that Jesus was really what he's pointing out about the water and the blood, although uh, those things uh, are very important and also do tie it with what I'm about to tell you, is what he's really driving at <clears throat> is that uh, the entire point of the epistle, from the opening pages, he's setting forth the fact that Jesus, as is, is both material and not just spiritual. And John opens this epistle. Remember, in the very beginning pages, he says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. So from the very opening pages, what John is setting forth is that Jesus Christ is not just a spiritual being, although he is that, right? He is also, he was very tangible and material. And he came to this earth, and, and they handled him, and, they, and their hands were upon him. And he is the word of life. 
And, and he goes on to say, for, for the life was manifested and was seen, right? This was visible and, and, uh, and bear witness and show unto you. And we, I'm sorry, and we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. So John is saying, we have seen Jesus Christ in the flesh, not just before he died, but after he died, right? And we covered this also very many weeks ago, that Jesus Christ was physically uh, hanging out with the disciples. And, and John literally, or uh, Thomas literally thrust his hand in his side, literally put his fingers through the holes in his hand. I mean, they had dinner with him. They hung out by the Sea of Galilee. Peter met with him. This was no aberration. This was no spiritual ghost man. This was a real person that they, they saw both before he died and then after he resurrected. Jesus Christ manifest in flesh and glorified and justified. And, uh, and then, of course, ascending in Acts chapter 1. And then replaces his physical presence with the Spirit of God in the church as it's born in Acts chapter 2. So verse 3 of 1 John 1 says, That which we have seen and also heard, declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And so our fellowship is predicated on what? Our relationship with the Father. So we come to uh, Thanksgiving dinner, at, and, the, and what do we all do before we, we eat? We, well, we pray. We thank God the Father for all the things He's got. Why? Because He brings us into the family, our physical nuclear families, but also the household of faith. Actually, more importantly, the household of faith. The household of faith is, is that those of us that are saved by faith, we have one father. And so we come to him, and, and when we get saved, he brings us into his family. So we're all one family in Christ. So it doesn't even matter your denomination, your background, your religious I don't care. It doesn't matter. Once you're born again, you're born again. It doesn't matter what title you put on the door, you're a son of God. First John chapter 3, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. What's your name? Your name is not Baptist. Your name is not Catholic. Your name is not Islam. Your name is not Buddhist. Your name is now Christian, right? Because you are in Christ's image. You're in the image of Christ. All right, so he, he also uses the same wording as Jesus used when speaking to Nicodemus, when he was t talking about being born again in John chapter 3. And so in John chapter 3, Jesus <coughs> likens the physical birth to being born of water and the new birth to being born of the Spirit. And so in John chapter 3 and verse 5, and you, you, if you don't have a Bible, or if you have a Bible, you might turn over there just to, if you've never seen this, some of you guys have this memorized. But in John chapter 3 and verse 5, Jesus is, is uh, meeting up with this teacher and, uh, named Nicodemus, and actually the Nicodemus is kind of scouting out Jesus at night. You know, he doesn't want anybody to know he's talking to him, but what Jesus has said has started to resonate with him. And for time's sake, I'm just going to skip down to verse 5. The Bible says down here in verse 5, Jesus answered. Well, let me just back up. So let me just go to verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, right? He calls him teacher, master. We know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. So we see the evidence of God on you, teacher. And Jesus, you know, just skips over everything and answers and says unto him, uh, Hey, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And he just jumps to this issue of being born again. Uh, and of course, we know now, in retrospect, this is dealing with being born of the Spirit. But he goes into this discussion with Nicodemus, and he says unto him, how can a man, Nicodemus says to Jesus, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter uh, the second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, uh, verily, verily, I say unto thee, and when he says verily, verily, he's saying this is really important. Except a man be born of water, okay, and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. So our, our baptism regeneration, friends, will say, see there? Unless you are, are baptized in, in water, you can't go to heaven. That's not what it's talking about. Uh, it's talking about being physically born. When you were born... I hate to get too crass here, but your, your mother's water broke, and you were born. And so you had a physical birth. But then there's also, that's not good enough. That leaves you in Adam's sinful image. And so you need the image of God, which is Christ. The image of Christ, well, how do you get that? Well, you have a spiritual rebirth. 
So when you bow your knee and you confess with your mouth and you say, Jesus, I'm a sinner. Forgive me. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. Come into my heart and save me. Or however you, you, know, however you come to contrition before Christ and, and, and confess your sin and, and acknowledge he is the propitiation. The, he is the satisfaction for your sin, right? Whenever you come to that place, when you came to that place in your life, how many could give a testimony right now and just say, man, I, I did that. I mean, amen. Now you can put your hands down. If you can't give testimony to that, somewhere in your life, I don't care if you have the date or the hour, I mean, you need to, that's where you need to stop and go back to this, and don't get off this point because this is the most important thing ever because that's how you get born again, right? Is, is calling upon the name of the Lord. You can physically kneel, you can stand up, you can sit in a chair. I mean, that's not, a, that's not the deal, but uh, I recommend if you're, if you're looking for a position, get on the floor, you know, and kneel before God, holy God. And, uh, and call on his name. He'll save you, right? If your heart's broke, he'll save you. If you're sincere about receiving him, he'll receive you. So what happens at that point? Well, the spirit of God comes in you. You are born again. All right, that's the second birth. That's the new birth that he's talking to, to Nicodemus about. Of course, Nicodemus couldn't have gotten born again at this point if he wanted to because Jesus hadn't died on the cross. But Jesus is setting up some things because he's pointing to the blood. Later on in this, in this little uh, example, he, he talks about being lifted up in the wilderness. What's he talking about there? But he's talking about Jesus Christ becoming sin for us who know no sin. Going back to Numbers, I believe, chapter 14, where there's a serpent on the pole. And so he, we used to sing a hymn, look and live, my brother live, look to Jesus now and live. It's recorded in his word, hallelujah, it's only that you look and live. Right? And, uh, and, we used to, and that's what that's, that little, on the medical uh, ambulance that goes by, and it's got that serpent wrapped around a pole, right? Well, that brazen serpent is, is, a, is right out of the Bible, right? That's what he's talking about in this chapter. So, uh, so there's blood associated with that as well. But into the text here, he says, uh, but Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now, if you have a King James Bible, you know, and, and you're, if you study out that word kingdom of God, that's a spiritual kingdom. Everything about it is spiritual. Kingdom of heaven, just went through this in D2, right? It's physical. And so uh, he's talking about a spiritual kingdom, and he's talking about a spiritual inheritance. That which is born of the flesh, there's your water birth, is flesh. And that which is born of the Spirit is Spirit, capital S there, Holy Spirit. All right, so marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. And then he gets into this issue, the wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and where it, whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. And of course, Nicodemus, he didn't understand all those things, so Jesus explains it even further. I'm not going to get into all that for time's sake this morning, but I want to just look at that passage and remind you that when we talk about water and the blood in 1 John, we're talking about a physical birth, um, and also we are talking about the blood of Christ, which we'll get to that here in just a moment. So nothing is mentioned of the blood in this passage in 1 John, or in John chapter 3, but I'm going to jump onto that in verse 8. So let me just finish this thought. So to finish on this thought in 1 John 5, 6, we see that he which overcomes the world does so by being born again, by faith. And in uh, verse 4, he says, Whosoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. So it's very clear. That faith placed in the one who came by water, physical birth, and blood, the Lord Jesus Christ, he was both... <coughs> man, he was all man, and he was also all God. He was the God man. And, and there was something special about his blood because it's the only blood that could atone for the sin of the world. And I'm, again, I'm going to pick this thought up a little further when we get down to verse 8. So this passage will be very helpful to those Jews in the tribulation who, uh, who come to uh, understand they missed their Messiah because they will read this in, in light of the fact that they got that Jesus Christ obviously came in the flesh, but he also gave his life on the cross, and many of those people will be martyred for the bulk, the bulk of the people, not just Jews, but also all tribulation saints. You endure to the end and be saved, or most of them, many people will, they will be executed by the coming Antichrist. So, so <clears throat> there's also a shadow uh, coming in the future in the tribulation for those entering the kingdom of heaven. Okay, so now that we understand 1 John 5, 6 is dealing with the veracity of his physical birth, not baptism, uh, we can continue on with our first witness in verse 7. So this witness, the Godhead, is also called the Trinity, and it's attacked. This, can you believe that? Can you imagine anybody would want to influence a witness in a trial? 
I know, it's incredible. My dad was on a, on a trial once, uh, Saul Landy, and, uh, and uh, this was a nasty mob hit over in KCK. And they, you know what they do? They sequester them. And they, and they, and they, uh, and they, they, this is long gone now, so you have to look it up in the archives. <clears throat> and, uh, and they do that. Why? Because they're worried that someone's going to get to the juror. And, uh, and it's going to mess up, or they're going to tamper, they call it witness tampering, right? You can mess with the witnesses. Why? So you can pervert the judgment. Well, guys, I got news for you. Somebody's about tampering with the witnesses and the record. And I'm telling you who it is. It's the devil. And I'm, and I, I'm, not, I'm not, now I'm going to say some things here, and I want to be very careful. Um, I'm not saying this to make anybody mad. I'm not saying this because I think any, I'm like, like I know anything I, like, any more than anybody else, right? But I, I need to be very clear here about the veracity of God's word, the importance of God's words. At this church, what makes us a little unique from maybe many other churches is that we really believe that God is giving us, has given us in English his words in the authorized version of the Bible, the King James Bible. And, uh, and one of the reasons, I mean, frankly, one of the reasons it's so easy to hold that position, this is rarely brought up, um, is because all the other ones are easily, uh, oftentimes shown to be in great error. And I'm going to give you an example right here. Because our, I'm calling the witness of the Godhead to the stand, but if you're using an NIV, you aren't going to see him there. If you're using an ESV, he's taken out of the text. He's not even invited. He's not, you're not going to see him. <clears throat> so the witness, the witness that you see in verse 7, for there are three that bear record in heaven. Who are they? They're gone. Now, my Bible says who? The Father, the Word, and then when we cross-reference the, 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 the capital W, and this is in verse 7, capital W-O-R-D, who is that referring to? Jesus Christ. You see it in 1 John chapter 1, John chapter 1, Revelation chapter 19, uh, Revelation chapter 1. You're dealing with the Word of God. Jesus Christ is the, that's a proper, that's a proper pronoun for Jesus Christ when you see it capitalized there. All right, so we know that. We're dealing with the Father, the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and very clearly here it says the Holy Ghost, the third member of the Godhead. It's the Godhead. And so most, if not all, modern English translations either remove this passage altogether or they attack it in the marginal notes. Uh, the New King James changes the word record to uh, witness and ghost to spirit. I mean, there is a significance to this ghost and the spirit, but we won't get into that this morning. But I'm not as worried about that as the ESV completely drops the word Godhead. I mean, I mean, not the word. It completely drops the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost out. The NIV removes the verses entirely, and you will not find the Godhead in this passage in the ASV, the RSV, the NASV, the NIV, the TEV, whatever that is, the Living Bible, the Message, the New Living Translation, the CEV, uh, the Holman Christian Standard Bible, or whatever else probably has come out since then. Um, now, that may not trouble you, but it troubles me. Because I can't imagine a verse like this that needs to be tampered with. Now, if you have a marginal note, it's going to say something like this in the passage, uh, that it's not found in the oldest manuscripts. And, and that's not actually true. Also, I was going to put it in my notes, but I forgot to do that. Uh, I was reading Warren Wearsby. Warren Wearsby says, well, you know, it's not in those manuscripts, but it doesn't matter. You know why it doesn't matter? Because you're not focused on the context of this passage. I hate to tell these guys that. They're focused on the blood or for the water baptism, the blood, and the spirit. That's a great little outline. I'm not against all that. I'm just saying, you're missing something when you take out the Godhead. How can you remove the Godhead, leave it hanging? They call it the, the, the I think it's the, the Donin comma or something like that. Um, and it's just hanging. They leave it hanging out there. And they say, well, it's just not found in, in the reliable manuscripts, the oldest manuscripts. And, and by the way, that's just not true. Now, there is a reason why there are many old Greek manuscripts that didn't have, have it in there, because there was a, a fellow named Arius, and he started a, a teaching called Arianism um, in the 2nd and 3rd century, so 200 to 300 AD. And despite what Jesus clearly said on multiple occasions in John, Arius taught that the Father is eternal, but Jesus didn't always exist. That would make him less than eternal. And he's not equal to God in that regard, which is obviously a heresy. And so he was begotten of God because obviously Arius missed what he's talking about is his only begotten son is Jesus. He was born of a woman. He's begotten 
He's the begotten of God. He's the only man, he's the only time God was going to be born was through Jesus Christ, and he fulfilled that passage. So Arius uh, misses that and says, well, Jesus was begotten sometime in the past, uh, like the angels were created, right, in the past. Uh, and so he's less than the Father. So the, and so he had this heresy, which is still taught today, by the way. And uh, Jesus didn't always exist. He was begotten of God and established in time. And, of course, that flies in the face of what the Bible teaches itself about who Jesus is and how he spoke the worlds into existence. And he watched Satan fall. There's so many references. It's, I don't have time to get into it. So the text was attacked, attacked in many Greek texts early on, but it was found in many earlier texts than that and many texts after that as well. And so uh, that, that scholars, by the way, modern scholars will not tell you this. I remember doing an assignment, having this assignment in HBI many years ago, and all the guys came back, all of the guys uh, in that class came back telling me what they heard on the Internet, basically, because that's all you're going to find. And I hated to bust this on them. There's an unbroken line of succession from the old Syriac version in 170 A.D. So there are Bibles that predate 200 A.D. that have the Godhead in it. But your scholars aren't going to tell you that. They may not be Greek. They're in Syriac. There's writers like uh, Tatian. There's old Latin versions by Tertullian in 200 A.D., Cyprian in 255, Priscillian and Athanasius in 350 A.D. At the Council of Carthage, it's found... Jerome quoted it, Cassadors quoted it, uh, Phalangetus uh, quoted it. Um, there's Codex found called the uh, Wayne Virginisus in 750 AD. It's found there. Minuscule manuscript 88, uh, 1115, 11, I'm sorry, 1150. It's found there. And there's uh, four different Waldensian Bibles from 600 to 1400 AD. It's found there. There's a minuscule manuscript, 629 in the 14th century. It's found there. And then there's that last one, the 60, uh, uh, minuscule manuscript 61 in 1519. That's the much uh, talked about Erasmus text that everybody talks about where Erasmus inserted it in there. Like he just pulled it out of his, I can't even say. Like he just, just, just found it somewhere on the floor in the closet and just stuck it in there. Erasmus had every reason to put it in there. It may not have been in some of those Byzantine texts, but it had been in, the, it had been in several texts for, since the first century. And so you're not taught that in Bible college, I guarantee you. So there's no doubt that this first witness is most credible. When you start to take out the Godhead, there's a problem, and, uh, in my estimation. And, uh, and, and so <clears throat> the one that produced, um, uh, <clears throat> the one that's produced by Erasmus, by the way, is the one that's discounted by uh, scholars. They take that one text and say, well, see, it's not, it's, it, that's not good. We don't, we don't agree with that. I tell you what, it's about the only thing that came out of a Catholic text that they haven't agreed with. I don't even understand that. What the reality is, is textual criticism puts the critic in the driver's seat. They become the authority. And so they become the vicar of Christ. They become the one that is the intercessor instead of the word of God, the spirit of God, and the local New Testament church and the priesthood of believers who God has used to steward his word throughout the centuries. So there is no doubt that this first witness is most credible, yet he is removed from the Scripture, so God won't allow you to get away with it. And especially if you've got a King James Bible, which, by the way, you think this Bible is not going to be under attack sooner than later? You know why it's going to be under attack? It isn't going to be because of this verse. It's going to be because of, it's not gender neutral. We don't, need, we don't have a transgender Bible. We don't have a gender neutral Bible. Man, it's no good. You've got to throw it in the trash. Guys, don't believe any of that. You've got to understand what time it is. And you need to hold fast to the faithful word as you have been taught. Words, I might say, plural. Hold fast to the form of sound doctrine. Because I promise you, this book, it is powerful. And uh, it is not in the preacher. It is in the words itself. The words of this book are, I mean, obviously, hopefully there's power in the preacher. But it comes from the spirit of God and the words of God. This book is the truth of God's word. So don't let anyone rob the witness from you. God gives us great symmetry as well. Let me just show you that real quick before we move on. There's the water, the blood, and the spirit in verse 6. And there's the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost in verse 7. There's three witnesses in verse 6. There's the Godhead in verse 7. And then we're about to look at the spirit, the water, and the blood in 1 John 5, 8. So we have three records here uh, in heaven. The Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. Uh, there's three records on earth, the water, the blood, and the Holy Spirit. And now that we've confirmed He is credible... Uh, got the first witness. Let's call our second witness. So the second witness is the spirit, the water, and the blood. Now, by the way, does anyone need to defend the Godhead? I don't. Uh, it def God takes care of himself. Uh, 
you know, there's a passage in, in Revelation chapter 22 that talks about people who add and remove from God's word. And so just be careful with that. Uh, so the second witness I've already touched on is the spirit, the water, and the blood. You see that very clearly in 1 John 5, 8, where there are three that bear record in the earth, the spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree in one. So just as the Godhead agrees, the witness of Jesus' death is recorded by the spirit. Again, the typical teaching here is that the water is Jesus' baptism in Matthew 3.13, his sacrifice, and then the spirit descending in Acts 2.24. So then you have the water, the spirit, or the blood, and the spirit. And so although those are all true, and that did happen, and those are important, uh, and all those are marginal doctrinal truths, I believe that the water and the blood referred to here is actually being connected with John chapter 19 and verse 34, and I put it on the screen. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith... Uh, there uh, came there out blood and water, blood and water. So when Jesus was pierced in the side, blood and water came out of his side. And that was witnessed here on earth by the Spirit. I believe the water here is in reference to Jesus' divinity. This is probably a minority position, but I believe that because there's something special about the blood of Jesus. He's fully God and fully man. He had divine blood and the Holy Spirit makes a point here in 1 John to point out the difference. In Exodus, Jesus' first miracle, uh, <clears throat> when the children of Israel were coming out of Exodus, his first miracle was to turn water into blood. And then he pulled out his people from Israel or from Egypt, took them out of the world. What was his first miracle in Cain of Galilee? He turned water into wine. What do we celebrate at the Lord's Supper? Unfermented Grape juice, the, the fruit of the vine. And we drink that. It's a, no, obviously, it is not the blood of Christ. It's a picture of the blood of Christ because he is the vine, right? And we are the branches. And so, uh, and, we're, and we're replicating what happened at the Passover feast. Jesus Christ is, 1 Corinthians tells us, our Passover, right? So there's something about the blood that was shed. And then when we get to the book of Revelation, and for time's sake, I'm just going to throw out some uh, verses. In Revelation 22 and verse 1, what you see is, is this lamb sitting on a throne. What's coming out of the throne? Anybody remember? Water's flowing out of his throne. And if you go back and look at the text in verse 1, and out of the lamb, which I, I presume would be his side. So he's like a fountain of living water. As a matter of fact, in the millennium, there will be a fountain of living water trickling out of the throne, and somehow it miraculously expands into a great river, into the oceans, and it literally heals the world in a very literal sense. And so that's not just present in the millennium. Then you go into Revelation 22, and you see in the third heaven, there's a lamb on a throne, and there's a fountain, and there's water, and it's like, what in the world's going on with this? I think there's something special about the blood of Christ, isn't there? He was all God, and he was all man. He was water and blood. And so I really think God is pointing us out uh, something there. And in verse 17 of Revelation chapter 20, 22, you know what that passage tells us? He says, hey, to the Spirit, the Spirit says, uh, the Spirit and the bride say, come, and all who will drink, right? All that are thirst, come. What are you going to drink of? The water of life. The water of life. How do you get that? Through the Spirit of God, through the Word of God, through Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. So regardless of your take on the water and the blood, I don't want to get in fights about it. <clears throat> Was it John's baptism and, and, the, and all of that? No, I'm not going to argue about that. I, I'm cool with that. All I know is this. There's something special about the blood and the witness on the earth. When Jesus died on the cross, the water and the blood, John says in John 19, 34, the water and the blood came out. And by the way, you got that recorded for you in your word in John chapter 19 and verse 34. So let's call the third witness. <clears throat> because, man, I tell you what, it's amazing when you think about what Jesus Christ has done to promise us the witness of eternal life. I mean, so we've seen, um, we've seen this. Now, he says in verse 9, if we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. So I'm circling back to the first verse I started with earlier. There's out of the mouth of two or three witnesses. For the, this is the witness of God, uh, which he hath testified of his son. If we can receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. Remember Philip? He's like, hey, show us the Father. He's like, I've been here the whole time, right? In, in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul says, you know what? Here's the gospel. Jesus died on the cross, was buried, and rose again. I'm summarizing it, and, and, and rose again on the third day. Then to the right hand of the Father, he's coming back. 
But he, he's very clear. He says, listen, there are above 500 witnesses alive to this day. This is 50-some A.D. And you can go talk to all 500 of them if you want. Why? Because everyone understood 500 eyewitnesses. If you have 500 eyewitnesses and they're all telling the same story, it's hard to line all those folks up and tell the same story. It's hard to pass anything. If I, there's not even 200 people here. If I started something over here with my daughter Elizabeth, and we, have you ever done that thing where you go through the crowd? It's always different by the time you get over here. You know, you say the car is blue and you get over here and it's like, it's carnal too. I don't know. But anyway, it's always, it gets messed up. And you know what? Paul's like, hey, listen, there's 500 witnesses. John is saying, hey, he opens this epistle. He says, hey, I'm, I was there. I've handled him. I spent time with him. I mean, I know this man. I can give you testimony. Everyone knew Jesus Christ was resurrected. Guys like Lee Strobel and, and Sir Robert Luckhoo, those guys have gotten saved just purely on the witness of men. The historical facts of who Jesus is, who he claimed to be, what is, what is based in evidence. There's more history, more facts around Jesus Christ and more record than you're going to find on George Washington, for goodness sake. If you believe in George Washington, why wouldn't you believe in Jesus Christ? I used to be one of those guys like, well, he lived in history, but he wasn't God. If you actually intellectually are honest, he could be nobody else. He is God, manifest in the flesh. And so that's what John's saying. Listen, if you'll receive the witness of men, if you'll put your life in a capital murder in the hands of a man or a group of men and witnesses, why in the world would you not put it in the hands of the witness in heaven? Why wouldn't you put it in the words of God? Why wouldn't you trust God? John is taking us somewhere because he knows the Holy Ghost is convicting men the same Holy Spirit that witnessed Jesus' birth, his death, and his resurrection, the same Holy Ghost that descended on the church in Acts chapter 2, the same Holy Spirit of God is walking through the aisles of this room, and he's going out through the internet, and he's looking all over the earth. You don't even need the internet. He's moving around, and he's asking people, in the courtroom of your heart, have you received the witness of God? Do you believe that Jesus Christ is who he said he is? And the Holy Spirit of God, his job, even before you're saved, is to convict you of sin. And understand who Jesus Christ is so you can be saved. And man, I can remember those days when I was lost, being convicted of sin. I tell you guys, it's, it's so important. If you're not saved today, you need to be saved. Long before I was saved, I, I remember God used creation in my life. And I started wondering, well, this is so incredible. It couldn't just be an accident. But then there were other times where God convinced me of my sin. I started asking myself, why am I behaving like this, even when I don't want to? And even though I wasn't a Christian yet, the Holy Spirit of God was just whispering in my ear, something's wrong with you. Something is not right. You know what? That was a witness. Leading me to Christ. Man, it was, I, I, you know, when I got saved, you, you know how I got past um, Jimmy Swaggart. And you know how I got past Jimmy Baker? All these preachers, when I got saved, were going down in flames. And uh, it was a joke, especially coming, I was lost. I mean, I'd look at a guy like Jimmy Baker and laugh out loud. Like, he looked like a cartoon character. Are you kidding me? Is there any, I couldn't believe anybody, Christian or lost, would even take that guy seriously. His hair, his wife's hair. I mean, the whole thing. It was just like, Wow. Uh, yeah, of course he's a loser. Okay, so, uh, <laughs> so, but people will use those things as excuses, right? Not to trust Christ. And then Jimmy Swagger. Now, Jimmy Swagger was a whole nother thing because that dude could sing. And, uh, and he's, he was smooth, smooth as butter. And he would preach and, and he, God used him in my life before uh, All-Star Wrestling. It was on every day after All-Star, or right before All-Star Wrestling, Jimmy Swagger would be on. And so I had to endure him before I could get to Rufus R. Jones and the Bulldog Bob Brown. That's right. And so, and so I'm like, man. Uh, but you know what? Before it's over, I mean, he's crying. I'm crying. I'm listening, you know. And I don't think I ever got saved. I do think God used Jimmy Swagger, though, to, to plant seeds in my heart. You know, the gifts and the calling of God are without repentance. All right. So there's all these scandals around all these guys. Oh, it's all fake. No, I tell you, it's not all fake because the witness is true. The witness is true. You know what convicted me? was the word of God. And the more the witness, you know what? The more the witness convinced me, the more the witness talked to me, the more the Holy Ghost would speak to my heart, the more I realized I was a lot more like Jimmy Swaggart and James Baker 
than the Godhead. That's what brought me to Christ. I had to be humbled because I was self-righteous. I really thought I was okay. And boy, was I wrong. I needed Jesus Christ. His witness is true. Of course people are going to fall. But when you understand that this book is true, what it says about your sin is true, what it says about Jesus Christ is true, man, examine the evidence. The witness is that of eternal life. God wants us to have life and that eternal through him. So point two, he gives instructions to the jurors in verse nine. He says this, if we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he had testified of his son. They listen, we can depend on the witness of John and the apostles. That's a good witness. Nothing wrong with that. But we can certainly put more weight and evidence on God himself. And we can receive the witness of his word, his blood, and his spirit. So here, that's the instruction. You know what? Receive God's witness. If you can't trust men, and hey, I get it. You can't trust men. Well, then be a scholar and open up this book and prove your theory. You are not going to beat this book. Don't tamper with it. Don't pull words out of context. Don't try to, to, to manipulate it like the scholars. Just take it for what it says. And you, what you're going to find is this witness is true. You have all the witnesses you need. Examine the evidence. And you'll come out with the right conclusion. Lastly, we've got to make sure that we render the right judgment. In verse 10 it says, He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. Oh, there's a Benny. He that believeth not hath, not, hath made him a liar because he believeth not the record that God, hath, uh, God gave, his, uh, gave his son. And so in verse point three there, render judgment, the judgment of the spirit is mentioned first. He that believeth on the son of God hath this witness in himself. You know what happens when you believe upon the name of the son of God? The witness comes in you. He bears witness with our spirit that we are the sons of God. He's already talked about that in previous chapters, right? That's how you have confidence because the spirit, the witness that's in you. And if you don't believe, if you don't uh, fall upon your knee and confess Jesus Christ as a Savior, guess what? You're calling him a liar. You are not more just than God. Point B, the judgment of unbelief comes as well in verse 10. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave his son. Listen, if you, if you believe that Jesus Christ is not the Son of God, you are going 180 degrees against the teaching, not of me, of this record that God has given us. And you are in a precarious situation. You're in the judgment of unbelief. And thirdly, uh, you need to make sure you have this record. Verse 11 says, And this is the record that God hath given us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. Once again, pointing to the Son, the propitiation for our sin in verse 11. The divine record points us back to the Lord Jesus Christ being the author of, and propitiation of eternal life. And lastly, and this is most important and will be done, is the verdict. The verdict. And this is what all this is driving toward, is some absolute, ironclad, no question about it, verdict. What is the verdict? And this is the record. The, <clears throat> this is the record. That God has given us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. The verdict is in. You either have life today or you do not. You either are convinced of sin and, and the Savior or you, stand in, or you stand in judgment and you call God a liar. You will accept Jesus Christ. If you don't accept Jesus Christ for, for the sacrifice of your sin, you will face the consequences of eternal death. But if you call upon the name of the Lord, very clearly the Bible says you were saved. And so my question this morning is, in verse 12, is he that hath the Son hath life. Do you have life? And he that hath not the Son hath not life. Do you have the witness dwelling in you? How are you going to get that witness? You must be born again. You've got to be born again. Conversely, man, if you're born again, there's all kinds of things that are going to come and shake your faith. And what do you got to do? You've got to go back to the record. I mean, you can believe the witness of men, but you know how you're really going to be stabilized? Going back to the record, going back to the words of God and what God has done for you in bringing his only begotten son to this earth. And, Paul, and John says, hey, listen, if you have fellowship with us, truly, truly our fellowship is with the Father in heaven. 
He'll solve all your daddy issues, man. And you will have assurance, you will have peace, and you will have everything you need for eternal life. Heavenly Father, we're thankful and pray, we thank, uh, thank you and praise you for the Lord Jesus. We thank you for calling these three witnesses, the, call, uh, <clears throat> the calling of the, the Godhead, of the, uh, the instructions of men. Lord, we're so thankful for the ability to understand uh, what we are to be doing, which is to render the judgment of salvation, eternal life through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, we're so, so thankful for the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Lord, we're thankful for the fact that Jesus Christ shed his blood on the cross, that he rose again the third day, that he's alive. We're thankful for the historical record. But Lord, right now, we need to have assurance in our hearts that Jesus Christ is who he said he is. With heads bowed and eyes closed, nobody looking around. If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, I just want you to know that the verdict is in. You're either saved or you're not. You're either in Christ or you're not. And, and John drives us to this point of decision because God wants us to make a point of decision, come to a point of decision. If you're here this morning and you're not sure, uh, or you're actually sure that you now need to trust Jesus Christ as Savior, we want to help you, and we can do that. And I know it's like hard to do in public, but just with everybody's head bowed and eyes closed, if you just say, hey, Brian, I want to make sure that I'm saved. I want to know that I have eternal life. The Bible says that you can. Our next verse that we're going to go into next week, we'll talk about that. You need to know you need to have the record. It's like a birth certificate. When you get saved, not only is that witness in you, but it, God seals our soul, the Bible says. He wants you to know that you have eternal life. Is there anybody that says, Brian, I need to have that assurance today? I'm not sure, but I want to be. Anyone at all? All right, let's, let's stand together. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for your word this morning. I pray, God, that it would be encouraging as we, cons as we consider your love for us. Lord, thank you for loving us and encouraging us in your word. Thank you for the witness of eternal life, uh, which is Jesus Christ, the word of God. Thank you for the spirit of God that teaches us all things. Thank you for the blood of Christ that cleanses us from all sin. Lord, I pray this week that our hearts would be uh, pure and clean as we think about these things, as we meditate upon your word, <coughs> as we give ourselves holy to the word of God. Lord, I pray, God, that uh, we, like John, would be a good example to those in our families as we go to Thanksgiving, as we go to work, as we go to school. People would see Christ in us and through us, and the love of Christ would be manifest. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to come together. Lord, I pray for your saints today, that you would encourage them as uh, we prepare to dismiss here in a few minutes. I pray, God, again for Sonia, uh, Lord Ferguson. We pray for her. She's uh, enduring uh, medical procedures right now to try to find out what's wrong with her. And uh, Lord, we just uh, also want to continue to pray for all those dealing with cancer and other ailments in the body. We thank you and we praise you and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.